and a very warm welcome to the final session of the Fluid Boundaries Seminar. And it's wonderful to see you all come today and to hear about Herman Melville and the interpretation of the greatest Melvillian text in film. And before we launch into the lecture, we have some surprises today, as some of you may have guessed. So we're going to honor Herman Melville and his creative spirit with some authentic music, some sea shanties, and Stephen and Steve have kindly agreed to provide some musical inspiration for us all. So please welcome Stephen and a sea shanty. Opening the floor to you, Stephen, please. So I think there's quite a large choice of sea shanties to sing um, and there were all kinds of options. I thought probably best to, um, to sing one that at least has some references to whaling in it, seeing as this is the, the theme of the day. Um, so I did come across a very old uh, traditional shanty, which is from, I believe, the first half of the 19th century. Um, it's called rolling down to old Maui and it's about whalers who are based in uh, Hawaii of course and um, who goes uh, whaling usually for right whales perhaps I don't know what else belugas in the, the Arctic Ocean and as most as many songs are it's about simply um, the joy of coming home after uh, an ordeal out at sea so rolling down to old Maui is probably quite familiar to some of you perhaps. Uh, okay. okay, let me know if there's a problem hearing or anything. It's a damn tough life Full of toil and strife We whaler men undergo And we don't give a damn When the gale is done How hard the winds do blow we're homeward bound from the Arctic sound with a good ship taut and free. We don't give a damn when we drink our rum with the girls of old Maui. Rolling down to old Maui, me boys rolling down to old Maui. We're homeward bound from the Arctic ground, rolling down to old Maui. Once more we sail the northerly gale through the ice and the wind and the rain. Them coconut fronds, them tropical lands, we soon shall see again. Six hellish months we've passed away on the cold Kamchatka Sea. But now we're bound from the Arctic ground, rolling down to old Maui. Rolling down to old Maui, me boys, rolling down to old Maui. We're homeward bound from the Arctic ground, rolling down. To old Maui. Once more we sail the northerly gale towards our island home. Our mainmast sprung, our way land on, and we ain't got far to roam. Our stencil booms is carried away, but care we for that sound. The living gale. 
After us, thine God, we're homeward bound, rolling down to old Maui, me boys, rolling down to old Maui. We're homeward bound from the ark to the ground, rolling down to old Maui. We'll heave the lead where old diamond head looms up on old Wahoo. Masts and yards are sheathed with ice, and our desks are heard from you. The horrid ice of the sea cake tiles, the deck, the ark succeed. We're miles behind in the frozen wind since we steered for all Maui. all around with chants and soft aloha ooze, they greet us homeward bound and now ashore we'll have good fun we'll paint the beaches red awakening in the arms of an island made with a big fat shaking head Coast of Greenland, 
I don't know about the rest of the group, but that reminded me very much of Herman Melville's time in Hawaii, shortly after his escape from the Marquesas Islands, where he went AWOL when he was a young sailor, still gathering materials, so to say, for his major works. Okay. So on this wonderful musical note, let us proceed to the presentation itself and let me just share my slides with you. Mm -hmm. Right. And please do tell me if you do not have any, um, uh, you do not have the slides or the slides do not work. Um, I see you. Yeah, because there are some previous slides. Uh -huh. Let me just go to the first slide because there seemed to be a bit of a problem. Okay, excellent. So there we are. Moby Dick and the representations of gender fluidity in the film versions of classic textual narratives. And the reason to why I chose to deal with such a big and heavy text, one of the landmarks of the great American literature, as the very last session of the Fluid Boundaries series was actually intentional, tying in the idea of something as great, uh, uh, as much of an edifice as the concept of the great American novel, and the idea of fluidity, a constant changing, the sea change, if we talk about ma maritime terms, and thinking about Moby Dick in particular, one would possibly argue that perhaps no other novel in American literature, maybe save something like Tom Sawyer with some interpretations for children, but no other novel has been reinterpreted time and time again in various forms of media. Film, political cartoons, allusions in a TV series or stand-up comedy, you have it. And as an archetype, the Herman Melville's novel is always there. It is present with us in this shared cultural space that we all have. Okay, so where does gender fluidity and the universalist theme of gender come in here? Well, you may argue, the notion of gender generally is a fluid concept and also a universalist one. And if we may remember, some of you who may have attended my previous sessions on other texts, particularly Israel Porter by Melville and The Spy by Fanny Cooper, may remember the concept of the neutral ground with its fleshlessness and constant change at the same time. 
And what happens there is that the concept of gender is also extremely fluid and in varied historical epochs. It attains different guises, highlighting and underlining different aspects that for each historical era are different. Everything, what, is, what is relevant for different historical era varies very, very widely. And so for today's session, I decided to, uh, that as well as dealing with the text itself, which would hopefully offer us some surprises, to cast a brief glance over several major productions, film productions of Moby Dick from the 1950s, the 1990s, and one of the most recent 20th century ones. And as we may would seem in Dulem, those productions highlight very different aspects and it would be interesting to attempt tying this in with what Melville himself may have attempted to say in the text. So let us proceed. So, as I said, Moby Dick is a classic and archetypal text of canonical American literature, and it addresses universalist issues, and it is quite interesting to note how different eras would address the different wide issues, particularly in how we should regard the representations of gender and particularly the representations of American archetypal masculinity at different historical eras. Because if we think about the field of film studies, film productions, generally speaking, would not tell us a lot about a historical era that they are supposed to show. Indeed, many a historian worth they sought even in the best of cinematic productions would be apt to show us at least several imperfections or errors that, and to be quick to point out that actually it was quite different at the time. That was not the correct military uniform or no, it would have been different. However, the cinematic productions of the films um, of the classical texts belonging to a particular epoch can tell us quite a bit about the epoch during which they have been pro produced and what occupied the public's minds at the time. Right, so Herman Melville, as a writer, would be seen if we think about the concept of the neutral ground and not quite belonging in the contrasting, uh, clearly set out Apollonian, so to say, world of, uh, of the general American society, the non-marginal society, we may name it. Melville always stands as a bit of a paraphrasing CLR James, renegade and castaway shunned in his lifetime for his frequently erratic writing style, which is obviously a source of delight and despair for many Mel Melvillian scholars, Melville is often seen as being quite irreverent of the clearly outlined divisive boundaries marking out what is acceptable or conventional or standard within uh, the Ameri mainstream American society of his days. Indeed, he, if to recall again the concept of the neutral ground, the writer himself may be seen as populating the neutral ground quite quite markedly in his work. And he seems to 
his, uh, the bo his boundaries in his world, literary as well as biographical, seem to be absolutely fluid. He seems to be quite irreverent of hierarchical, national, or societal divisions. And as we can see from some of the correspondence to uh, with Nathaniel Hawthorne, Melville uh, speaks openly that he uh, wants to go beyond the societal pretenses of what one can or can it be? And as he says, with no son of man do I stand upon any etiquette except the Christian ones of charity and honesty. He speaks about his ruthless democracy. He declares that a thief can be as honorable a personage as General George Washington, which is quite a powerful statement to make in America of Melville's day. And as I argue, to kicking off the discussion on the representation of gender as seen by Melville, this is echoing quite well then one of the key pillars of queer theory in literature. Basically, transgressing the, div the boundary dividing them public and private, the acceptable and the non-acceptable. What Melville seeks for, what he is longing for, is the truth, the essence of things. And he wouldn't stand for any societal pretenses or etiquette or artificially devised rules that perhaps mark out this fine line between them, between the private and the public and the, or the acceptable as George Washington, the archetypal image of American masculinity and American patriotism, and the un completely unacceptable as a thief. Herman, in, the, in doing so, Herman Melville shows himself as the perfect product of the neutral ground that, that la lays between the axis of the acceptable and the unacceptable in society. The genuine writer whom consorted, consorts with cannibals in his writing and goes further and deeper than most would dare. And his text, his major text, his chef d'oeuvre, Moby Dick, obviously was not well received by the reviewers at the time of its publication, 1851. And I argue that this was not simply because of it being quite difficult and enigmatic to read for an average reader. In, in asserting a variety of themes and what is more important, a variety of characters in Moby Dick, Melville brings forth this almost Bakhtinian carnival of the very strange and unusual and often disquieting personalities who seem to completely overturn and even challenge the stalwart ideals of masculinity in something as seemingly associated with conventional American manhood as the world of whaling. And if we look at uh, how Moby Dick is con conventionally seen by those who perhaps may not have read it before, or if we look at the classical illustrations by the great American artist Rockwell Kent, which um, held by many as the exemplary images associated with the novel, we would argue that Moby Dick is the tale of quintessential American masculinity. There are hardly any female characters in the narrative, save for a few supporting 
uh, supporting ones at the very beginning of the novel, whom sell, who do not really contribute much to the plot. The entire this literary space, the microcosm that Melville's characters inhabit seems to be very rough and ready, full of harpoons and tales of skullduggery on high seas. And yet, let us look closer at the three principal protagonists, whom, do, uh, whom do, in Melville's text, play the most important parts. And I am going to speak of, um, to for uh, particular to those who have read the novel before, but perhaps if you haven't yet, you would meet them when you read the novel. And these are Captain Ahab, the archetypal captain chasing the white whale, the dark sea wolf on an ivory leg. Ishmael, the amorphous and unusual narrator of this story, and Ishmael's dark double, or the love of his life, the island prince Quiquek. And if we look at those three characters in depth, we would notice that they are in fact very far removed from the staunch images associated with seafaring yarns like Treasure Island and the likes of that. In that, all three are highly unconventional and perhaps would be seen far more at home in the world of queer theory and reading the text from that angle than from the ordinary uh, vantage point of the adventure on high seas. Captain Ahab could be seen as representing disability. And uh, a lot of moments in the text seem to draw our attention to his bodily incompleteness, which makes him again rather amorphous, unusual, and certainly standing at odds with them brash, masculine, heroic outlook that which would be expected of such a sea wolf. Ishmael is quite, is rootless. He, he has no wife, no family, no home to go to, and in fact, no fixed identity. We would look at him later. Finally, Queequeg's ethnicity posed um, subject for many a debate among the Melville and scholars of who or what culture or who in particular would have been the prototype for this character. And many fascinating theories abound, but certainly Quiquewig's ways and manners again make him stand at odds with the world, with this highly ordered and rigid world on board of a whaling ship. Indeed, again referring to C.R. James, those three characters are the finest band of renegades and castaways one could have imagined. And they, in re representing them, Melville sometimes even goes to the point of them grotesque, showing the three as being excessive, unusual, strange in their ways and in the events that befall them. And in that way, they seem to make a little mocking face at the rigidity of their naval day-to-day -day existence. One could argue that all three of them could be the finest examples of the neutral ground and the characters that may inhabit it. Right, so what can be seen from uh, the first pages of the novel? One may think that we are meeting, well, the Yet another yarn on the life of the sailors and their masculinity, uh, securing their masculinity. 
all whalemen, chief mates and second mates and third mates and sea coopers and blacksmiths. And Melville seems to almost parody this stereotype of brash naval masculinity in laying on so powerfully the imagery associated with it, almost to the point of parody. The brown and brawny company with bosky beards, note the alliteration, a shaggy set, all wearing monkey jackets for morning gowns. Seemingly, what seems to go on here is the, that the world of whaling is quintessentially male. And they all seem to resemble each other. You, you may see the, 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 the sailors as this rather homogenous band and note that their ranks like chief mates and third mates are mentioned, but names not so much at this point or any perhaps physical individual bodily traits. The masculinity at this moment is seen as a mass, this collective stereotype or archetype of what a whaleman or a good American sailor should be. And yet, if we go away from this idea of this homogeneous mass of all those Figure, individuals making up one collective and instantaneously recognizable and conventional archetype, we are then faced with the character of Quiquek, whom Melville mentioned at this point, who seems like the Andes western slope. And in using this image, perhaps Melville doesn't want to speak just about the various um, <laughs> tints of ten, which show to how long each character has been at sea. No, what Melville does here is underlining Quiquag immediately as an unusual and grotesque character who in his sheer individuality and his unusual ways stands at odds with the mass of those sailors who would go on various ships other than the Pequod, representing this collective archetype of what a true masculine sailor must be. The Pequod to Melville is a space where different castaways and unusual characters and eccentrics converge. And if we recall again the concept of the neutral ground, Pickwood could be seen as the segment of that very unusual space. And their individuality is not lost as in a uh, as in the situation when we think about those various sailors in the bar room of the Spout Inn. No, we in Pequod, individuality is what matters. And various individual traits that diverge from the masculine archetype, perhaps rather strongly. And so, first of all, let us meet Quickwick, possibly the most enigmatic character that Melville has created. And if you do not mind, I have prepared some clips from various films, film productions. So I'll just stop the sharing of the slides for the moment and we would uh, watch the clips through YouTube because the, I, the computer has not been kind in letting me in, embed the movie clips straight in the, into the presentation. So please bear with me for one second. Um, uh -huh, uh -huh. Right. Um, Uh -huh. Right 
here we are. It may take a while. I'm sorry, my YouTube is so slow. Hmm. Let the clip load. Can you see, can you hear the sound? Because um, I can only see the images um, from YouTube, but I can't I can hear. I think the sound is working. Not for us. Yeah. Oh dear. Just just the image. Mm -hmm. I mean, I saw the movie, so I know <laughs> what they're saying, but I can't. Hmm, I'm not muted, so I don't know. It must be something with the clip, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, so right, but I think we've, if we've seen the clip, right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so oh, I think Dirk has an idea of how to to do the share the computer sound. So we'll yeah. try that on the next clip, not to lose any time. Okay, so what happens here in the 1950s production though, if we focus on the character of Quickwick? One may say that this, the 1950s production is perhaps taking the Melville text almost word for word and letter for letter. And it is being quite nitpicking, I would say, in, in the, how it chooses to represent the narrative. Note that both characters and it seems to be quite strange, are shown to be on the equal footing with each other in terms of their masculinity. They are shown to be of the same age and perhaps roughly the same level of experience in terms of whaling, even though Quickweg may be seen as rather unaware of things such as books. At the same time, though, and I guess this is quite disturbing for the present day viewer, one may sense a touch of the white savior about the character of Ishmael and how he is shown behaving towards Quickweg, explaining to him what the book is. I guess the true bosom friend of Melville's tale Ishmael at that point maybe is not. He's seen as rather this staunchly masculine, grown up, one may say, figure who seems to be guiding and directing the supposedly savage impulses of Wickwag, who is shown to be a um, rather mellow character who is perhaps 
quite comical in a way how he is leafing through this edition of the book and trying to comprehend what the matter is. And perhaps in this short scene, we see the main aspects of them, gender as an idea at the time of the 1950s. So male friendship is shown as friendship, masculinity is still very much stereotypical, and yet someone as unusual as Quigpeg is gently shown to be somewhat to, of a figure of fun, rather than a powerful and unusual and potentially dangerous presence that he is in the original Melvillian text. And of course, there is also a touch of racial controversy about that scene, something that in the later years would be, would be seen as rather discomforting. Yet the, both characters are very much the same age and quite equal in terms of masculinity and the impression of power. They they seem to project. Quiquick seems to have the physical strength. Ishmael seems to have the intelligence. But in terms of whaling and sailing experience, they are seen to be as equals. Right. And let me just share the slides. Share the slides. Do, 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 do. Mm -hmm. Let us go back to them. Slideshow. Mm -hmm. Right, let it just go full screen. My computer is so slow today. Right. And yet, what can we say about Quiquig as a character? And what is shown quite correctly, though, in that clip from the 1950s production, is Quiquig as a separate individual object, an entity in himself, as opposed to this amalgamated mass of the sailors I've mentioned earlier. Indeed, as Melville says plainly, he never consorted at all but very little with the other seamen in the inn and appeared to have no desire to enlarge the circle of his acquaintances or, in short, to mix with anybody. And perhaps in showing this, Melville suggests that Quiquig is quite secure in his identity. Whatever it is, and no matter how, mu how much it may be at odds with the stereotypes about what masculinity and the masculinity of a whaleman should be in them conventional American eyes. He is seen as a soul entity, and indeed, in the 1950s production, we see him by himself, and in this way, perhaps them. The uh, director was quite true to this aspect of the character that Melville seeks to show. However, showing Quiquig as someone insecure about reading and quite laughable and someone who needs Ishmael to point out to him how things should be done and how books should be read, I guess undermines this aspect of Quiquig, which is insecurity and complete ease with who he is. A man some 20,000 miles from home by way of Cape Horn, among people as strange to him as though he were on the planet Jupiter and yet entirely at his ease, preserving his utmost serenity. And as Melville says, always equal to himself, 
we may say that Quigweg is a perfect individual who we can say is populating the, the terrain of the neutral ground, secure in his identity, no matter how these guys may be interpreted by the onlookers. Right. And of course, since the neutral ground is generally populated with unusual and strange types, Melville notes quite plainly that a man like Quickwick you don't see every day, his way were well worth unusual regarding. This ties in well with my earlier concept, uh, development of the concept of the neutral ground, that this is a literary space populated with unusual creatures, unusual habits, unusual people, and in there, just as Mikhail Bakhtin would have it, everything is topsy-turvy, turned from head on, from, to, uh, from heels onto the head, and from he head onto the heels, and this is juxtaposed with the regular world, as we know it. About them gender, how we see it. As Melville says, quick, quick, do you see, was a creature in the transition stage, neither caterpillar nor butterfly. And although, of course, Melville strives for a comical attempt in describing quick, uh, amusing ways in trying, in, uh, trying to dress himself in clothing, which is obviously alien to him, being neither caterpillar nor butterfly can also be interpreted in the way that he is neither male nor female in the way how the conventional world would view him. And moreover, and it is uh, quite an insidious hint from Melville, uh, being neither caterpillar nor butterfly and neither male nor female is also underlined by the fact that Quigwed is at ease with masculine clothes, conventional masculine clothing that he is um, expected to put on. And as we know, in the world of how we see gender and how it is to be interpreted, clothing as you may remember from the previous lectures, plays quite an important part. You are, to quite a, to a large extent, the gender that you are showing to them why the world is, can be at first determined or shown to the wider world by the kind of clothing or garb you choose to wear. And Obviously, what Quiqueg's story has also to teach us is the idea, if we remember the scene when Ishmael and he discussed the various customs of uh, Quiqueg's native land, Rokuboko, and um, America, and Quiqueg says, well, didn't our people laugh? when someone uh, uh, shows this complete disregarding of them? Quickwig's people's own customs, just as Quickwig is ignorant of the American customs. What we see here is the idea that what is seen as conventionality and conventions of gender as well is very fluid and very arbitrary and quite relative from place to place. And therefore, Quickwig's masculinity is important in that he is primarily secure in himself, in what he is as a person. And as to uh, he, he has chosen what he who he wants to be himself, as for the impression he makes on them, onlookers around him. We may well just as well respond. Well, what do you think now? Didn't the people? Didn't our people laugh? It is all a matter of perception. Now then, of course, there is the, the elephant in the room, 
or namely the idea of Ishmael and Quiquel's relationship. And if we recall the clip from the 1950s film, at that point, when homosexuality was still a complicated topic to be discussed freely in public, the friendship of Ishmael and Quiquel would be seen as the protagonist and his dark double, the intellectual spirit and the fleshy savage spirit, Gilgamesh and Enkidu of their archetype, the civilized man and the wild man. Indeed, this was perhaps an interpretation from the 1950s production, and yet the blatant homoeroticism of this scene, which has of this relationship of the two characters, which has been discussed in many and many books and research papers, takes on a rather different guise in the 1990s, during the in the 1990s production of Moby Dick. And we will duly see the little clip. Wait, 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 wait. If, let me see the YouTube. Share screen. Right. Can everyone hear the sound? No, I don't see the screen. So this is the 1998 production, the mini-series about Moby Dick. No sound. No sound. If we just watch it without the sound.
couldn't hear it. Right. So, as we can see, then, as we can see, the 1990s production was quite different in the way that how Quiquag is represented, the notion of this gender fluidity, and particularly, ah, oh, what was that? Oh dear. Okay, so let us resume. And as we can see, then 1990s production is a bit different from the 1950s one, in that it seems to explore in far more details and perhaps with a bit of a comic outline their relationship of Ishmael and Quiquag as something more eroticized, something where the homoerotic desire is definitely more marked and there is more sense of a relationship in the romantic sense rather than the intellectual and the uh, wild man, the Gilgamesh and the Enkidu archetype of friendship we see in the 1950s production. And also Quiquag's savage ways, his dangerousness is highlighted perhaps more in that clip and Quiquag is played by the actual South Sea Islander by a, no, by a Pacific Islander, Pirope Varitini actor, who is a bit different from them, the, from Friedrich von Lederberg and his rather comical representation of Quiquag in the 1950s production. So the 1990s miniseries strives more for authenticity and representing of Quiquag's ethnicity, and, yeah, in, as in him being different and in representing also his and Ishmael's relationship. And in that way, perhaps the 1990s show this pivotal point in cinematic history where the topics of race and homosexual relationships are becoming more acceptable to discuss openly. But, and uh, so we can see here the actual names of the actors who represented the character in different at uh, different points in time and if Moby Dick in the 1950s the character in that film the character was represented as being at the same time true to the original Melvillian narrative in terms of appearance as in shaven head and then body shape and the behavior and, and yet at the same time being quite um, I guess, secure in, the, in his masculinity and yet quite comical. In the 1998 miniseries, show Quiquag as this rather dangerous romantic lead and his relationship with Ishmael as constantly hinted upon, whilst the 2011, the latest version, the character of Quiquag seems to blend in quite seamlessly with the rest of the crew. As unusual a character that he is, Quiquig doesn't seem to stand out in that production, but what happens is that he blends with this mass of archetypal masculine sailors populating the Pequod. Some are the characters whom we would duly look at taking the front on the stage instead. And as we can see from the costume of Rao Trujillo, it is quite conventional, quite re resembling what the rest of the crew wears. He doesn't stand out. His relationship with Ishmael and the connotations it may have is not at the forefront of the story. So at this point, what happens is that Quiquag is reabsorbed back in them 
main conventional body of the crew. And his unusualness is not as relevant anymore as the unusualness of some other characters. So, let us then have a look at how Ishmael, the rootless Ishmael, is represented in each of the productions. And speaking very briefly about the, each of them, and we would not watch any clips anymore, I promise, without sound, no. We can say again that we've already seen in the 1950s production, Ishmael is seen as this still very archetypal, very staunch, paint by numbers, American sailor. The 1998 production is more interesting in that, of course, his relationship with Quickwag takes the central stage and is constantly hinted at. And moreover, in that production, Ishmael is shown to be as somewhat a damsel in distress, so to say, or that another orphan whom Rachel picks up at the end, just as Pickwood sinks down and every, the world as we know it is destroyed. There is so this angst and November gloom about the character that Melville hints at at the beginning. Whilst in 2011 uh, production, yet again, we see Ishmael as blending in just like Quickwag with the rest of the crew. We do not see him. He forms one of the units of the general masses of the sailors. His story, as interesting, as notable as it is, is not already as relevant as the, what occurs with between Ahab and the whale, so to speak, so the main plot conflict in the tale. And let us then compare those three different ways of portraying the character with how Melville chooses to show him. Ishmael is the pale usher, threadbare in coat, heart, body and brain. Then uh, the words such as dust, dusting, the complete rep repetition of that, of this adjective, the poor devil of a sub-sub, the hopeless and sad, adjectives such as hopeless and sallow, pale, sherry would be too rosy strong, the concept of paleness and the cold, suggest the image which we have seen in other texts during those series as well, from the spy and Israel Potter and others beside. The idea of fleshlessness as a queer, Je are more amorphous in terms of gender, personality. Ishmael is seen as an essentially fleshless presence. If Quickwag is secure in his fleshy presence, as unusual and as disturbing it may be with all the tattoos and his outlandish appearance, then appear uh, them images associated with Ishmael suggests this everyman who is erotically ambiguous, physically ambiguous and almost not there and therefore able to take on any guise or identity he pleases, which Melville can hints upon in mentioning a queer handkerchief, mockingly embellished with all the gay flags of all the known nations of the world. Ishmael can be mocking like a perf queer performance artist in that he can um, take on him any guise or any nationality or any identity he pleases at the wave of the handkerchief. His fleshlessness is far from miserable. It allows him a variety of guises and a, a variety of aliases. He is definitely not tied up to the staunch masculinity of the whaleman we have seen in the previous images. Even his words, call me 
Ishmael suggests that Ishmael is not the real name, it's just one of the uh, many different aliases he can pull, pull at random, as if from the head. What is more important? When Melville discusses Ishmael's desire to go to the sea, whenever he feels depression, isn't that a bit strange and a bit of a radical way to deal with his autumnal blues? When he says, I am in the habit of going to the sea whenever I begin to grow hazy about the eyes, we may note that Melville is using the image of the sea as the metaphor for this neutral ground where the carnivalesque comes to its own, where the boundaries of gender, the boundaries of class, the hierarchical boundaries become fluid, they merge. Strange characters, unusual characters like Ahab or Quiqueg appear on the stage. Any guys or any name, Ishmael or any other, can be taken up on the scene. Moreover, we note that Ishmael seems to speak specifically of this. And, uh, and he, as he says, I never go as a passenger, I, nor do I ever go to the sea as a commodore or a captain or a cook. In saying so, in, the, in describing this, Ishmael is seen as this erratic wanderer, not affixed to any place whatsoever. He abominates all honorable, respectable toils, trials and tribulations. And by stating so, so explicitly, we may see that Ishmael is shown as representing the queer spirit at its finest, difficult to pin down, elusive and absolutely free and liberated. He is the perfect sign of the neutral ground and maybe his fleshlessness and his inability to pin down is an advantage rather than a trait which is commonly associated in Ishmael with tragedy as in being rootless and having no place to truly identify with. Perhaps we should envy Ishmael rather than pity him. Right then, now finally to Ahab who has been caricaturized powerfully throughout various his uh, political cartoons and films as this idea of the grabbing, go-getting masculinity in pursuit of the go, right? I'm abstaining from any political references whatsoever at this moment, but let us have a look at how Gregory Peck plays Ahab in the 1950s production. Isn't his gesture not reminiscent of Uncle Sam and Lord Kitchener? And wouldn't we say there is this particular mockery or parody of this staunch traditional patriarchal oppressiveness? With, with this patriarchal figure who points, I want you to go there and do this, and in doing so, sends a whole generation of men to their doom in the maelstrom caused by Moby Dick and Pequod's demise. And I think that perhaps this gesture of Gregory Peck, a great actor that he is, is not just accidental. But the 1950s production seems to parody this militaristic spirit, this destroying, crashing patriarchal spirit that was undoubtedly still very fresh in many of the audience's minds. Now then, speaking of Ahab's character, what can we say when we mentioned previously his disability. We see there seemed no sign of commonly bodily illness about him. And moreover, Melville emphasizes that his high broad form seemed made of solid bronze, 
and shaped in an unalterable mold like Cellini's cast Perseus. Ahab's physicality is strange. His ivory leg certainly is an image that sta stays with you for a long time. Yet at the same time, Ahab seems to be almost immured like a fly in amber in this rigid coffin almost of patriarchal masculinity. And perhaps this is what hints that in being uh, in being disabled, in being physically different, in being unusual as a character with the unusual desire, with his unusual fixation on Moby Dick, and yet at the same time being forced to play out this bronze statue of some great patriarch of your is what causes this entire pro problem in Ahab. He cannot be either secure in himself, like Quiqueg in his strangeness, or fleshless and easily adaptable, like Ishmael. And possibly, Melville seems to say, it is this conflict between the actual nature and between what Ahab believes the world expects to see of him is what brings doom for him and his crew. Now, if we look uh, very briefly at how the, the character of Ahab is represented in the two later productions, we may see that in uh, the 1990s miniseries, Ahab is seen indeed as this older, masculine, patriarchal, political leader who is nevertheless quite demented, eccentric, and almost, you would say, a Bond villain. And um, Patrick Stewart plays out this archetype with all those tropes highlighting the bad leadership. Then to 2011 version is more about, I guess, the psychological drama of characters and various conflicts that they have. And basically the conflict between the ordinary hum human perceptions of Starbuck and Ahab's monomania is taken at the forefront at the expense of Ishmael and Quiquig's relationship and everything else. It is more psychological than anything. And Ahab in the 2011 production, I guess this is my favorite representation of him, is not seen as this archetypal villain or this dangerous leader from the past anymore. He's seen as a human being, albeit a highly problematic one. And perhaps not conforming to them any gender stereotyping or roles, he's just human and he's the way he has been, his terrible experiences have made him. Okay, and finally, if we consider Ahab, the quintessential image that Melville associates with him, and I would associate also with the concept of the neutral ground, is the idea of the little lower layer, well hidden underneath the various pasteboard masks and guises and various images of how gender and how carrying yourself and representing yourself to the outside world can be manifested or various guises one can adopt. The unreasoning mask is just one of the number. And indeed, as Ahab prophetically says, if men will strike, strike through the mask. What is found underneath the mask nevertheless is something that does not belong to any divisions of gender or class or race or ethnicity. It is something much broader than this. It is called essence, individuality. And perhaps Quiquen has been the most, uh, uh, has been able to seize upon this concept most efficiently. Ishmael is more of seen as someone just trying on a variety of masks one after the other, yet we never manage to meet his actual essence. And I think the key to that 
very point that Melville seems to drive home can be also found at the very beginning of the novel, where Melville shows all those various different names for a whale in different languages. Hvalt in Danish, whale in English, Pekinuinui in Fiji. There are all different names and guises and customs and how the concept of whale or gender, if we see the whale as a metaphor for the gender, can be seen in different circumstances, different eras, different epochs, yet underneath, essentially, it is one same whale. And once this whale makes this appearance as this great equalizing force, which I argue is the reality before which all various difference and traits are erased, we may reiterate in the word, final words of Melville as Pickwood is going to the bottom of the sea in the maelstrom. Now small fowls flew screaming over the yet yawning gulf, a silent white surf beat against its steep sides, then all collapsed and the great shroud of sea rolled on as it rolled 5,000 years ago. As we may note, Melville put truth before everything else. All various customs, various differences of how something is supposed or not supposed to be represented. It was all immaterial to Melville. To him, it was just a variety of guises that Ishmael adopts as he continues on his journey from one ship to the other. And at this point, I wrap up and thank you all very much for listening. Right? And... Yeah.